Hello there. Okay. Sharks. Even in the modern day, there's a surprising vast variety of shapes, sizes, types. Sharks are a very ancient group, and even sharks today, lots of them, still very ancient looking. Before, before I get into that, welcome back, or welcome if you're here for the first time to the Elasmo Bronc Evolution Podcast. Ooh, it's been a few years since I've said that. It's given me nearly some chills. Um, yeah, these are not always easy to make. And I'll get into more of the formalities at the end. I mean, this is quite a topic, isn't it? Because you think sharks, okay, most of them must be the same. Okay, but first and foremost... This will not be a super in-depth episode, not very advanced information. It's going to be more of a general overview of the different types of reproduction in sharks, uh, to be honest. Um, if you already know a whole bunch about the topic, you may not find most of this very enlightening. But I still think it's very interesting, and even people that know it a bunch can still revel in the fact that, hey, sharks do not all reproduce the same way. The way a young shark pup is born from one type of shark can completely differ from another type of shark. How, how neat is that? Not very many animal groups you can say that. So, yeah, I think there's this misconception or common belief, and it's there for a reason. I was talking to one friend or family member. I asked them, hey, do you know how most sharks are born? They're like, oh, they're all born by live birth, right? You know, I think they see on TV or they've heard, they remember from school that they're born alive. Most sharks are born that way. But actually, a significant number of species, specifically in a couple of groups, are actually hatch out of eggs. Yeah, you heard that correctly. They hatch out of eggs. And I'll get more into depth about that. And by eggs, I don't mean inside the shark, you know, all... I think all animals hatch out of an egg out of some sort, but I mean the shark actually legs an egg and eventually, hopefully, a shark hatches out of it. And uh, I guess as a baseline, it's important to say how do most fish reproduce? Of course, most fish are bony fish, right? You think of a fish, you might think of some of the typical aquarium or other types of fish you might catch while fishing. Those are bony fish. They have bony skeletons. Um, those are completely different from sharks. Very, very anciently removed. Right? I know every kind of vertebrate shares a common ancestor somewhere in the evolutionary history. But sharks evolved from other types of fish a long, long time ago. Way before the dinosaurs. So... I mean, I think there's a whole podcast a podcast about that topic, isn't there? Isn't it how paraphyletic of a group to call everything that has gills a fish is? It's a very vague term um, because to call a shark a fish and a bony fish a fish, like they're completely different. They're very m removed evolutionarily by hundreds of millions of years. So. But before I get too sidetracked, so most bony fish, right, they reproduce by the females release eggs into the water column or the bottom, and males will release sperm in the water and will fertilize the eggs externally from both fish. That's unlike sharks. Sharks have internal fertilization through a clasper on the male shark. I might get into that later in this podcast or maybe in another podcast. I mean, th This is not specifically made for kids, but yeah, shark uh, reproduction, the making of can be quite rough to say the least. <laughs> I mean, you can't take yourself too seriously, but getting into my notes here. Um, yeah, so before I get into the differences, general differences between bony fish reproduction and shark reproduction. So I know this is, doesn't per se have to do with an ancient shark paper or book or 
any fossil extinct, long extinct shark. I know that. But still, shark evolution, you have to think there's reasons why some sharks evolved to reproduce differently. You know, it's still debated, I suppose, what the ancestral reproduction mode of sharks is. I found some conflicting data. I haven't looked too, too much into, into it. This is more of a general overview of modern sharks, but they definitely evolved to have differences, right? And they don't choose, per se, what reproduction strategy they have. It's just what works better in the grand scheme of things that sticks around, and that's how natural selection works. So before I get sidetracked again and follow my general notes, fish lay hundreds of thousands if not millions of eggs and they externally fertilize them and they're just out there in the open on their own right nature knows that many other types of fish and other predators will eat a lot of those eggs but they lay so many that a very small proportion of those fish will make it to adulthood and that's why they lay hundreds of millions of eggs. So, you know, <laughs> inevitably some of them will become adults and will propagate the species. As opposed to sharks, sharks have barely any offspring as opposed to bony fish. Bony fish have to, because their eggs are so vulnerable and exposed to the elements from the get-go, they have to lay so, so many eggs. And it may seem at first maybe, okay, they lay so many eggs, that must cost a whole bunch of energy. But actually, it isn't that energy intensive. You know, all you have to do is lay a bunch of eggs and deposit a lot of sperm. That That's not very much of an investment. Versus lots of sharks will lay eggs, or will have a shark developing inside them. And commonly depends on a bunch of energy directly from the female even or near for the time of fertilization i'll get into the specific types subtypes so that's much more energy costly but because they have a much better chance of reaching adulthood after they're born because they resemble a sub-adult miniature adult shark right sharks do not have parental care they're not birds, they're not mammals, they're not crocodilians. The mothers couldn't care less about the sharks. In fact, if you have an aquarium, you have mother sharks right there beside their offspring. Commonly, they eat them. And we may think, oh man, that means sharks are evil. No, nature isn't evil. It does what it does, and it does what works in nature. Ultimately, an aquarium is not nature. It's not natural. So, you know, and lots of sharks actually will fast. The females will fast while they're pumping. And then they'll leave the area. Whereas in an aquarium, they can't leave the pumping area. They can't leave the deeper water. So, yeah, it makes sense. They're going to be opportunistic about what they feed on, you know. They're just trying to make it. And they don't know any better. They just eat whatever. So... Of course, in nature, it's not always clear what's going to be the next meal, whether there's going to be a next easy meal. So it makes sense that sharks are opportunistic feeders. And when I said shark pupping, I meant that shark offsprings are called pups. I know it's just a word, but just for future reference, when you hear me say shark pups, that just means shark offspring, newly born sharks. I don't know why they're called pups. Seems like a dog phrase, like dog pups, but I don't know. That's just what they call shark offspring. Newly born sharks are called pups. And so, of course, <clears throat> most of us know most sharks are born alive out of the female shark. But if some of them aren't born that way, how are they born? So, of course, there's eight different orders of sharks, most of which, or all of which, diverged during the Jurassic period long before the extinction of the dinosaurs. So it's over 500 described modern species in eight different orders, right? 
They come in a vast range of shapes, sizes, habitats, depths, feeding preferences, types of teeth, um, specializations, numbers of gills, etc. So it only seems natural that some would be born out of eggs and some are born alive, right? You know, even in the same family of sharks, they can reproduce differently, not exactly the same. So, first type, most types of sharks are born this way, is called ovoviparity, which is live birth, and they're nourished inside the female shark with a yolk sac. This is the most common type of reproduction, around 50% of sharks, modern shark species, are born this way. So eggs inside the overduct that hatch inside the parental shark pups are stained and fed by the unfertilized egg yolk as well as by special secretions by glands in the overduct walls. So they usually hatch around three months from fertilization. Um, they continue to feed off the remaining egg yolk as well as the gland secretions. Um, so this includes the cow sharks, hexanchiforms, which are the most ancient of the modern shark orders, Greenland sharks, nurse sharks, whale sharks, other carpet sharks, and only three species of cat sharks, some triacid, hound sharks, pseudotriacidae, which is in carcharinoforms, includes the false cat shark and the genus Gollum shark, which are in caves. Modern mackerel sharks, which includes the great white basking shark, mako, goblin, etc. Cookie cutter sharks, angel sharks in the order Squatinaformis, and saw sharks. Not to be confused with sawfish. Sawfish are actually much more related to rays. So that's some of, if not the vast majority of sharks that reproduce by the oviviparity. Whereas they're born live, but they have a yolk sac, as opposed to carcharinoform sharks, which include the bull shark, lemon shark, blue, silver tip, oceanic white tip, black tip, spinner. These are born from also live birth, but this is called viviparity is live birth with placental connection but this is an intimate placental connection whereby they have a actually are connected by um umbilical cord connected to the mother for nourishment even to the point where they're born much like mammals actually because they're fish this evolved independently from mammals and of course that's convergent evolution Similar evolutionary traits are evolved independently, which is not that unusual at all, actually. Happens a whole bunch in the evolutionary record, if you look close enough. Oh yeah. So of course, we know the ovoviviparity is the most common shark reproductive strategy, whereby there's live birth, and the young are only attached to a yolk sac from birth. So... It's much more energy intensive than bony fish that lay external eggs. Of course, the gestation period where sharks are born is only about every 9 to 12 months after fertilization, right? And these sharks don't reach sexual maturity until many years, unlike bony fish that can reproduce after only a couple or so years. Some sharks, I have some numbers here, it takes pretty much the same as humans to reach sexual maturity. Great hammerheads, 9 years. Bull sharks and lemon sharks, 15 years to reach sexual maturity. Spiny dogfish, 20 years. So you can imagine if these sharks are being overfished, it's harder for them to rebound in population. And they don't reproduce every single year. So, yeah, more celebrating their... Uh, their long reign of success more than bemoaning the present as depressing as it is they're definitely quality over quantity which favored them in the past nowadays it's getting harder and harder for them to survive let alone thrive but what can you do so the second most common reproduction strategy for sharks is to actually lay eggs they produce relatively large egg cases 
encapsulation of fertilized embryos and structurally complex and remarkably durable shells, commonly referred to as mermaid purses, as with the case with cat shark eggs cases, resembles the egg cases that uh, skates will lay. Of course, rays and skates are separate, even though they look separate families of rays, even though they look really similar. It's kind of like alligators and crocodiles. They may look very similar, but they're actually pretty distinct, whereby pretty much all rays... Wait, I have a book here. Yeah, it looks like pretty much all rays reproduce by viviparous, you know, live birth, whereas skates will actually lay egg cases, and those are out in nature exposed to the elements and eventually a young will burst out of the egg case and then live on its own you know my sources here are saying no rays are known to be oviparous which is laying eggs by a source from 1999 hamlet instead rays display a placental viviparity or ovo viviparity instead yep Rays give live birth, and skates are the ones, they're more diamond-shaped, but they're their own separate batoid group, right? But this is mainly to focus around sharks. So, oviparity, egg-laying, approximately 40 to 43% of all shark species, but I had another source about tiger shark evolution, how they evolved to now be Avo viviparity, right? A placental. It said only 30% of modern shark species, which maybe because that's a newer source, maybe there's now more requiem sharks described. Maybe that's why it only says 30%. All right, around 30 to 40% of sharks lay eggs, modern sharks, which that's still a significant proportion, even if it's only 30%. And most people don't know that, that there are sharks out there as ancient and not very shark, typical shark looking they are, right? These horn sharks, which are part of their own ancient order, if you just look at their head, these bullhead sharks, heterodontiforms, right? If you just look at their head, they don't look very shark-like at all. It's not until you look at their whole body and their fins, like, oh yeah, now, now they kind of look like a shark. And of course, you know, they study their genome, they study their general makeup and their skeleton. They're clearly a shark, even if, you know, they, they don't get very big. They stay around the bottom. I don't think they're, they have a very global worldwide distribution. Yeah, very ancient group. And these are the ones, their egg cases are very spiral shaped. So they'll lay their egg cases and they commonly wedge in between rocks. Right, the males will push the egg cases actually to kind of wedge into the rocks. Otherwise, the tides might wash them in the shore and they'll have no chance of hatching, which still happens, which is why the bullhead sharks, the horn sharks, lay a bunch of eggs. I think I heard they lay about 55 per year, something like that. Um, and those horn sharks, they commonly have spines that come out of their dorsal fins to prevent bigger predators from swallowing them. Also a lot of carpet sharks, including bamboo sharks, will lay eggs instead of giving live birth. Of course the vast majority of cat sharks, which are a carcariniform shark, like the tiger shark, bull shark, spinner, etc. But actually the cat sharks represent the largest number of species of any shark in a single family. There's over 150 species, which for there only being 500 modern shark species, that's quite a lot of sharks. Um, yeah, 152 species, mostly up to one meter or three feet. Rectangular egg case with tendrils on the sides and the total egg case, it's more of a leathery, more skate-like egg case with some tendrils that will catch on to the seaweed or kelp egg case will be about two to four inches or five to ten centimeters 
also zebra sharks. I'm pretty sure zebra sharks are part of the cat, the carpet sharks. Also a very pretty looking shark. Stays around the bottom. Not a top hyper predatory shark. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. You tell me. Um, do most people expect sharks to lay eggs? Uh, I, I really don't know. I have some more notes here. Of course, when they hatch, they still resemble miniature adults. Most sharks that hatch out of those egg cases are commonly 8 to 12 inches, 20 to 30 centimeters long at birth. Bullhead shark eggs commonly hatch after about 6 or 7 to 12 months after being laid. Of course, that's faster in warmer waters and slower in colder waters, you know, because that slows down their metabolism. So that's, that's still a substantial amount of time for a shark to form you know some will be laid in seaweed or sponges instead of rocky areas and horn shark eggs because they're so spirally i suppose and they're so big i saw some pictures i didn't find any description of how in quantitative terms and number how big the shark spiral egg cases get unfortunately but I saw some pictures, they look around almost the size of somebody's hand. So maybe about thir three to four inches. So maybe like 10 centimeters, something like that. So pretty sizable. I don't know the max size, but they look pretty considerably large. Um, but you know, young sharks only get so big. And, uh, oh, I meant to say earlier. Um, so most sharks only have a few offspring at a time. Unless they're laying eggs, and then you never know. There might be a whole bunch. There might be only a few. So, biggest litters are produced in the open ocean. You know, there's less places to hide. And they can be easily gulped up. So, those open ocean sharks need to produce a bunch of pups. Blue shark. Um, blue shark being a carpariniform, typical looking shark. But they're very interesting, very fast sharks. Very interesting in their own right. Even though they are kind of built for quantity more than quality. At least compared to like Mako sharks and other certain kinds of sharks. They can have up to 135 pups in a single litter. And for whale sharks, you know whale sharks being the largest living fish. They're filter feeders. They're not whales at all. They're, they're carpet sharks. Oh, and I've seen them at the Georgia Aquarium. I'd highly recommend that. Even though they're, they're not the max size they get. They can get up to like 40 feet long. Um, but I think they're about 15 or 20 feet. Still pretty sizable. Um, whale sharks can have up to a 300 per litter. And I've seen some pictures of some uh, whale shark pups. They look like they are come out pretty big. Maybe about a foot long, a meter. Don't quote me on that. Um, I could be wrong there. But at least they have a whole bunch of pups. Whereas most sharks, <clears throat> especially when they give live birth, they only have a few per litter. I know tiger tiger sharks can have up to 80 pups. Or wait, I think I heard great hammerheads can have, have up to 40. Yeah, and tigers can have up to 80. Um, but there's some species like uh, sand tiger sharks only have two sharks per litter. And actually, sand tigers they're they're ovoviviparous. You know, they have live birth where their young sharks are just connected to a yolk sac. They go through something extra interesting whereby they have two uteruses that have apparently 50 pups per uterus. And the first one that will hatch out is already a miniature adult. Okay, apparently blew through the nourishment in its yolk sac, but it needs to keep growing. It needs to keep feeding. So... What it'll actually do is eat the other pups in the uterus, right? This is called intrauteral cannibalism, which occurs most famously in sand tiger sharks, those being popular lamniform, mackerel shark, ancient looking. They have those slender, long, snaggle tooth looking, ragged teeth. AKA gray nurse shark. I don't know why it's called that in some parts of the world. Um, but it also happens in a few other species. 
It also happens in the, a few other lamniform sharks, including crocodile shark, three species of thresher sharks, thresher sharks being the ones with the very long tail fin, caudal fin, basking shark. That's very surprising because there's filter feeders, but I suppose when they're younger, they're kind of more predaceous. I, I don't know. And a few other, I knew, I, I knew I'd read this in a book or something that both mako shark species also engage in intrauteral cannibalism. And the white shark, poor beagle, and salmon shark. <clears throat> and also among the carcharinoforms is also known in a few more prehistoric, basal, more primitive, quote unquote, and the golem sharks, which are the slender smooth hound shark, and the false cat shark, pseudo trigus. And I thought about making a podcast about that shark. That's a very odd looking or pretty interesting shark, that false cat shark. I saw some click baity looking look what at this shark they caught off of Scotland. It's very prehistoric, very weird looking, but actually there's actually some interesting facts about the false cat shark besides engaging in intrauteral cannibalism. It's a deep dwelling shark and it's very prehistoric looking. You know, but I guess that's any shark order that has a bunch of species, high species diversity, you're gonna have a few oddballs, I suppose. But still, oh yeah. So, of course, as you'd expect, the sharks that lay eggs tend to lay more eggs than the sharks that give live birth. Because, of course, not all the eggs are going to become adults. Whereas the pups that are reared to be have nourishment during many months of either getting nourishment from a yolk sac, if not direct placental umbilical cord nourishment are going to be much more developed and have a much greater likelihood of reaching adulthood than the ones that just merely hatch out of eggs. So oviparous egg laying sharks can lay up to 200 eggs, but as few as 10 eggs, right? Yeah. Whereas the ovoviviparous Sharks usually have very small litters, only one to eight pups per litter. Sharks are overall built for more quality over quantity, but you know, there's still some gray areas even among the shark orders. Which, you know, the book I was describing earlier is called The Biology of Sharks and Rays by A. Peter Klimley. Very quality Sharks and Rays book. It goes in way more depth, maybe for most people's taste, but it talks about shark reproduction very much in depth. And it has a very good chart that shows all the modern shark orders and how abundant in each shark order or family, how diverse their reproductive strategies are. Okay, so and it says yolk sac viviparous, but that's OV viviparous. Um, of course, the Hanks Inca forms, Pristio for which are the saw sharks, Squatina formis, which are the flattened Wobbegong and angel sharks, and the half of the squaliform sharks, which are dogfish sharks, apparently have yolk sac reproduction. About half of the carpet sharks. Yeah, and apparently like around the other half of carpet sharks lay eggs. No species of lambdaform mackerel sharks lay eggs. They're all... Oh yeah, ophagus is the other term for when the sharks in the uterus, they eat the other uh, sharks. And it's saying that 100% of modern lambdaforms do that. Some corcoriniforms do that. Not a high proportion, but enough to list it. Yeah, corcoriniforms, you know, that's hundreds of species of sharks. Around half of those, or almost half of them, are placental viviparous, um, which means they have an unbiblical cord. You know, that's only around 10% of modern sharks, if that. I think it was an old source. Maybe it's less than that. Maybe it's more. I'm not sure. That's a very costly investment 
to have sharks constantly nourished and depend directly on how much the female mother shark feeds. They're getting nourishment directly from the shark, right? But if that mother shark stays healthy and keeps feeding a bunch, then you're going to have very successful offspring. And lately, ever since the Ligocene, if you know about the fossil record of sharks, carcharaniforms have taken over the mackerel shark reign ever since the Ligocene epoch when climate change started to get colder had some extinction events toward the end of the Eocene as deserving of its own podcast. But for some reason or another, the modern ground sharks, requiem sharks, carcharaniforms highly took over. Now there's hundreds of species of carcharaniforms and only about a dozen or so lamniform mackerel sharks. But it used to be the opposite. Anyways, so yeah, carcharaniforms, they have ophagus, oviviviparous, some of them are placental viviparous, some of them have oviviviparous, and some of them, oh yeah, oviviparous are the cat sharks, yeah. Um, so they they have the most diverse assemblage, although I, if I remember correctly, I think carcharaniforms might be a hodgepodge paraphyletic group that has much more individuals that are distantly related instead of all in a single group that has a clear common ancestor. But don't quote me on that. I'm pretty sure I read that a long time ago. And a long time ago anyways, it'd be in the Eocene, if not the Paleocene, since, you know, lo not long after the dinosaurs that Carcharaniforms even diversified in, or, or no, actually it was before then, because I heard in the aplacental loss in tiger sharks, tiger sharks radiated around 90 million years ago. Um, but anyways, you have to think, most living vertebrates are oviparous, they lay eggs. Of course, because most are bony fish and reptiles. Reptiles on land, that's very advantageous to lay hard-shelled eggs over giving live birth. And I'm not here to speculate why that's the case, but there's advantages and disadvantages. Of course, you're putting an egg out there in the environment, it's exposed to the elements. Unless the parent sticks around. Of course, they're not actively deciding this, but... So I, I don't know exactly this is just luck of the draw or what as to how much parental care or if they give live birth or laying eggs. I, I don't know why so many species of sharks, you know, display so many different types of reproductive strategies. Even dogfish sharks. Half of them have yolk sac viviparous, which is oviviviparous, and half of them have yolk sac histotrophy. Which I had to look that up. Um, not very many sources talk about histotrophy. This is from Wikipedia. is a form of matrotrophy exhibited by some live-bearing sharks and rays in which the developing embryo receives additional nutrition from its mother in the form of uterine secretions known as histotroph or uterine milk so it's still a type of aplacental vivipary but it's more complex than just pure yolk sac can be contrasted with yolk sac vivipary in which the embryo is sustained by yolk and ophagy in which the embryo feeds on ova or other eggs so it's pretty complex how many different types of live bearing there is it's not just oh these sharks give live birth. They're all nourished in the same way in the shark. That's clearly not the case. You, know, you can even see in those carcharaniform sharks that are born, they have an unbiblical cord when they are born. Whereas other sharks, they only had a yolk sac. They just, they're free to go, you know. I mean, all sharks fend for themselves when they're born. They're born fierce predators. They have all the instincts they need to go out and start feeding from the get-go they don't need any parental care at all unlike many animals and I don't know why that's the case maybe because they're a more ancient animal and they can just sharks in general are much more advanced you know you see in these phylogenetic trees just because they diverged a long time ago they're generally considered more primitive than lots of animals that they still have very advanced specializations and characteristics they definitely have a bunch of those and evidence is all over the place with that. 
how they have super senses. Look at hammerhead sharks. They have ampullae of Lorenzini all over their heads. They can dig out stingrays that are even buried a few feet under the sand. Right? Sharks can detect your heart rate. So if you have a super high heart rate and you're very nervous around sharks, they might think you're prey. They're much more likely to attack you. And that's kind of unfortunate, but something to keep in mind. Most sharks will leave you alone. Just stay calm and have the right body posture, but you'll learn that. You know, if, if you're going to truly dive with sharks and you want to be super knowledgeable, there's all kinds of tips you can look up to have the right body postures and all that good jazz, you know. Oh, and there's actually one more type of shark reproduction I forgot to mention. Asexual reproduction. They can reproduce without having fertilized embryos, which that's not unheard of. There's several reptile species that can do that as well. But, you know, still very interesting. Humans can't do that. Most mammals, if not all mammals, can't do that. Don't quote me on that. But uh, anyways, um, here's some facts. So, of course, sand tigers... They hatch out around 4 inches, 10 centimeters, eat their developing siblings. And when they're born, the pair are about 1 meter long or 3 feet. So you have to think from a 4 inch, 10 centimeter shark, keeps eating the other developing sharks, and eventually grows to be 3 feet, 1 meter long. That's a considerable amount of time and a considerable amount of growth. Well, you know, that's uh, nature survival of the strongest, recycling the nutrients, you know. Clearly, it evolved sand tigers and lots of those lamniform mackerel sharks evolved for quality over quantity. Spiny dogfish shark can be pregnant up to 24 months, two years, which is the longest gestation period of any vertebrate. I thought that's pretty neat. I think I'd heard elephants are also very long, about a year or so, but apparently spiny dogfish, that they only grow so big. Dogfish sharks are not very highly predatory, but still very interesting. Very diverse shark order. Oh, there's another form of oviparity described in 2020 in a species of cat shark in the South China Sea called sustained single oviparity, characterized by a lengthy retention of a single egg case in the oviduct until the embryo attains a sizable length. So I'd heard some general conflicting advice that the ancestral state at first I heard vivipary was probably the ancestral state but I thought ovipary laying eggs was the more primitive state and uh yeah it was from wikipedia that said vivipary is the ancestral condition for sharks it evolved from the elongation of retention time of retained ovipary oh oh yeah so yeah, I, th I think oviparity actually is the ancestral state because even in modern sharks, so retained, there's several types of oviparity. Whereas retained oviparity is eggs are kept within the oviduct for a period of time before depositing outside the body as an unhatched egg case. In single oviparity, eggs are laid soon after fertilization. So, yeah, so there's several types. Clearly, it seems like viviparity became more favorable if natural selection selects for longer retention and hatches uh, sooner if they're released from the body closer to the time of hatching. And this is just speculation, but it seems like if there's a bunch of structure and places to hide away from predators because when you lay an egg whether it's in an egg case or a spiral or whether it's in a leathery mermaid purse or one of those spiral horn shark eggs it seems like or i know they can be eaten or washed ashore but if there's some kind of adaptation that they can attach to rocks or get wedged somewhere which clearly that's the case you know those mermaid purses have those tendrils that can attach to seaweed or kelp and the wedges can wedge in between rocks. That greatly increases the survival rate. Because, again, it's several months. At least six or seven months up to a year. Until those eggs hatch. And even then, there's no guarantee that that shark will make it to maturity. So there better be several egg cases that 
hatch off, you know. So, yeah, so there's clearly those three, three main types of reproduction, laying eggs and live birth. Live birth either through placental connection or umbilical cord or just live birth and they only have a yolk sac, so no connection to the mother. And of course, they want even more quality over quantity. Those lamniform sharks, uh, mackerel sharks, the ones that hatch out early will eat their siblings before they hatch off. So that further increases their survivability rates. So uh, yeah, this is pretty good over... Oh, <clears throat> also meant to talk about asexual reproduction. What kinds of sharks are known to do that? Oh, but vivipary, um, yeah, so that's the most advanced type of shark reproduction, and they're only known to have 2 to 20 pups per litter. Wait, I thought great hammerheads. Hammerheads have vivipary. Oh, I thought I heard they can have up to 40. Double check. Yeah, great hammerhead, 6 to 42 pups once every two years. Okay, maybe that's just average 2 to 20. Yeah, that, that makes more sense. And, uh, of course, asexual reproduction is known in Komodo dragons, some snakes, rays, and, of course, sharks. Asexual reproduction, of course, they realize it when they keep these female sharks in, in captivity. After many years, they reproduce. They think, what the heck? Were they fertilized a long time ago? But then when they study the genomes of the sharks, they look... A lot of times they're exactly the same as their mother, so clearly they just they can reproduce completely asexually without any fertilization somehow. This is known in zebra sharks, reproduced after three years in captivity in 2017, had the exact same genome as its mother. It's also known in the smooth hound shark, reproduced asexually in 2022 after a decade in captivity with only another female White spotted bamboo shark. Bamboo sharks, fairly small, very popular in aquarium, aquaria, black tip sharks, and bonnet head sharks. So, even the sharks that have viviparity are known to reproduce asexually somehow. Pretty interesting. Of course, you're not going to propagate a whole species based on only asexual reproduction because they're not changing their genome, they're not adapting. But So you're having larger number of sharks, but if they need to evolve, need to adapt, they're not going to be able to. That's the, of course you learn that in general biology. I'm not, this is not a general biology course, but, um, and of course commonly sharks are born in nurseries, shallow pupping areas to improve the pup's survival chances some sharks give birth or lay eggs in nursery areas here the water is usually warm and shallow it's a good food supply and few predators once pups have reached a good size they leave the safety of the nursery and enter the big wide world in deeper waters with less protective structures usually um, but again you know because there's less offspring they're higher quality they need those shelter areas, which I think it was a big factor in a lot of species of sharks going extinct over time. There's less shallow, and there's sea level drop. You know, you lose a lot of shallow habitat. And you're not going to have as vast, large nursery areas as there once was. But maybe that's another talk for another time. Uh, so yeah, I'll post all these uh, links some of my data notes yeah so sharks again lots of people think about sharks are one size fits all but that's clearly not the case come in all kinds of shapes sizes even deep different reproductive strategies um, even among modern sharks lots of diversity lots of things to think about different adaptations for different habitats different niches some sharks live on the bottom they can get away with laying eggs they can have eggs that hide in places some sharks you know there's 
less places to hide unless they go to more shallow waters. And they seem to be very product, very successful over evolutionary history, having more quality over quantity. And especially in predators, high competition. Um, you got to think sharks are also competing with marine mammals, other bony fish predators, other sharks. So it makes sense that they want to give, or what's successful is having miniature adult sharks, right? I know there's the competition exclusionary principle whereby, you know, you can't have two predators competing in the exact same niche. But even then, um, with sharks competing against each other and in a general, you know, there's many fish that go after a single bait school. Um, so it makes sense that sharks need to have all the leg up that they can get. Um, they're toothy predators from the start. They have all the instincts they need. That's good. So, yeah, that's a pretty good overview. Give all my links. Oh, about shark reproduction. Uh, of course, as I said earlier, they have claspers. They tend to bite each other and get in the commonly mate on the ocean floor the male you know will bite and twist sometimes they'll wrap around the other shark if they're super small and flexible otherwise they might just uh you know bite at certain places and do the best they can to subdue the female and actually they're not monogamous at all um, i saw one source saying even in a single litter and this is good for genetics, you know, to have good genetic diversity. Um, a single litter of sharks will commonly come from multiple males mating the same female. Which by our standards is kind of messed up. But you think about in nature, you know, it's a free-for-all. That's a good thing. Good to increase the genetic, genetic diversity. Give sharks more of a chance. Um, so, yeah. Have any questions, suggestions, future topics? Not sure how much I'll cover this topic in the future, but it is interesting to think about. It's one of those factors. It's like, oh my goodness, sharks are so diverse. Even They don't all even reproduce the same way. Super ancient, super diverse type of animal that we all tend to say shark because they all look similar, but you have to think these animals these cartilaginous fish although they look similar they diverged a long long time ago they've been doing their own things they've been evolving independently for very very long even long before mammals existed at all you know so but they've continued to evolve even past the dinosaurs um, and uh they'll keep going on until they can't oh yeah yep so don't know how often I'll be posting these, or making these. You know, I love sharks. They fascinate me. Um, these, these podcasts are kind of energy intensive and research intensive. And uh, I made, actually, if you guys really want me to make lots of episodes, made a supporter support link. Let me see if I can find it. Yeah, so I'm sure I'll put this in this description. Um, it's at www.buymeacoffee.com slash dman9fp, which is my YouTube account name, dman9fp. Sure, I'll also post this on Podbean and maybe someday to more, uh, to more platforms, maybe. So, don't have a Patreon yet. I don't know if I'll ever do that. Of course, I have more interests in life, nature-related, and mostly, you know, besides just fossil sharks. And it's kind of unfortunate there's nobody else taking the reins right now. Um, <clears throat> but sharks still fascinate me, inspire me, etc. There should be people spreading the knowledge and 
you know, I just think in general, the world needs more fossil extinct animal and evolution podcasts besides just dinosaurs. Dinosaurs are very neat and interesting in their own right, don't get me wrong, just like the great white shark is. Just because maybe they're a little bit overrated compared to other animals doesn't mean they're not interesting in their own right. But again, I think very interesting, ancient, success successful animals, especially ones that have survived many mass extinctions and are still going strong in the present, deserve attention and study. And I can't tell, reveal absolutely everything, but maybe this will inspire some people to take their own steps to do further research and further keep learning, keep appreciating these animals and spreading the word. Yep, we need more people supporting nature and loving nature. And not just uh, when they seem super bad and intense. And, you know, um, of course we all love our predators and uh, super big stuff. But, you know, just because I know some of these epaulette sharks, you know, when I took the EDX shark course, one person in that course said they're their favorite shark because they live, live in super anoxic waters and they eat poisonous prey and they have all kinds of adaptations living in a hostile environment. It's like, huh, that, that makes a whole bunch of sense. Right? Um, just because it's not the biggest, baddest shark doesn't mean it's not interesting and it can't, it can't be somebody's favorite, you know? I think they ate poisonous urchins or something like that. Yeah, some of these sharks, you know, they have, they kind of like walk along the bottom and they can stay at the bottom a long time and they look like sharks, even though they might not function like a stereotypical shark. Sharks are very diverse and very deserving of praise and they've had a bunch of success in the evolutionary past especially and deserve to keep living on and have all kinds of protections and uh yeah i think that's a good way to end it if there's anything else i might add in the comments um and yeah that's about it okay thanks for listening all right see you